This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio. Definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. Ireland's Aran Islands are hauntingly beautiful, a place where the people still speak ancient Gaelic, and time seems to have stopped. Michael Fallon's recollection of his visit to the Aran Islands is both an adventure and a comedy of errors, and a humorous, you-can't-get-there-from-here story. He arrived to the Aran Islands by taking a ferry from Galway City. Though everyone spoke English, and though he asked repeatedly, he could not learn how to return to the mainland in time to catch his flight home. There's no ferry that goes to Galway, he was told by every Irish person he asked. But how is it that he could take a ferry from Galway to the Aran Islands, but could not take a ferry back to Galway? How did the ferry he took from Galway get there in the first place? Michael Fallon is a senior lecturer emeritus in the English department at the University of Maryland. He is the author of four collections of poetry, and his essays and poems have appeared in numerous literary journals and magazines. His innermost ear is always turned to what the Irish call the music of what happens. Red Fairy, Blue Fairy, an Irish lesson in how you can't get there from here. Written by Michael Fallon. Read by Colin Wasman. It was the last full day of a week I'd spent in the Aran Islands, a group of three islands on the west coast of Ireland. I had been trying to get a ferry from Inishmore, the big island, as they called it, back to the city of Galway. Everyone I asked said it couldn't be done. I kept saying over and over that I had come here to kill Ronan, the main harbor of Inishmore, on a ferry from Galway City. So why couldn't I take a ferry right back to it? The ferry doesn't go there, I was told by every Irish person I met, islander and tourist alike. So where did the ferry come from that brought me here from Galway, I would ask, incredulous. How did that ferry get to Galway in the first place before it came here? There's no ferry that goes to Galway City, was the flat reply. To an American traveling in 1986, Ireland was an eccentric place. First of all, the Irish assumed you were a decent, well-meaning person until you proved otherwise. And they had, and still have, a great love for stories and the talk. Yet strangely, unless you asked precisely the right questions, that love of elaboration seemed to disappear if you wanted all the precise and pertinent information about where you were going and how you were going to get there. This was how it was when I, an Irish-American from Baltimore, went to the Aran Islands in June 1986. It was just a month and a half after the horrific terrorist bombing of TWA Flight 840 from Los Angeles over Argos, Greece, and the details were horrific. A young Lebanese woman had placed a bomb under a seat during an earlier flight, and on its way to Athens, the bomb blew a four-by-three-foot hole in the fuselage. Four passengers, including a mother and her nine-month-old baby, were sucked out of the cabin. Not surprisingly, at the time I was set to travel, many Americans were afraid to take a flight to Europe. It was long before the internet, cell phones, and Googling, so in a sense, I was on my own and left to my own devices to find my way. I had a general mental picture of the map of Ireland in my head. I knew where the major towns and cities were, and, yes, I had paper maps. 
But these didn't always have the best local pubs or the most interesting ruins marked. And I often had to ask for help with the when, where, and how of buses, trains, ferries, and pathways. And as for the talk, Though I really enjoyed the friendly and often interesting twists and turns of conversation with the people I encountered, I would also find myself tapping my foot, impatient, for instance, to get out of an Irish version of a 7-Eleven and back to the road. After all, I had other places to go and people to meet before sundown and the first pint of the evening. I laughed and learned and was thoroughly entertained. Yet when I got back to my journey, there was often something unexpected out ahead of me, as if hidden in a mist. If I kept my mouth shut, I was sometimes mistaken for an Irishman, if not for an islander. As soon as I spoke, my American accent gave it all away. Yet I was met with kindness, warmth, and friendliness, which is entirely natural for Irish people, who for some reason hadn't yet had it all hammered out of them. Sometimes I was treated like a distant cousin, maybe because there was still an echo of the gale in me. But often I was referred to as the American, and then I was aware of all that made me separate. The ocean, the divergent histories, and the years. I never felt more like an American than when I was asking for directions. The Aran Islands are one of the few areas left where people grow up speaking Gaelic as a first language. These islands are in the extreme west of the country, long considered the most traditionally Celtic and the least affected by the long centuries of English rule. Thus, they are not only one of Ireland's most remote places, but also, according to the English, among its most uncivilized and, therefore, wildest places. You may have heard of John Millington Singh, 1871-1909. to He was an Irish Protestant, a non-native islander, a non-speaker of Gaelic, and so considered a foreigner. He briefly lived in the islands and based a play, Playboy of the Western World, on Irish types he had supposedly observed in the Aran Islands and elsewhere in the western counties. In the play, Christy Mann, the main character, becomes a hero in the local tavern and then the town, especially to the women, by enthralling everyone with the story of how he has supposedly murdered his father, a task he, unfortunately, must attempt twice in order to make his story true. Still, success somehow eludes him as his father, though twice presumed dead, miraculously manages to survive both attempts. When it debuted in 1907, the play was famously booed off the stage and caused a full-scale riot at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, which boiled over into the streets. The Dubliners hated Singh's portrayal of backward, superstitious, drunken, and dangerous peasants from the Wild West of Ireland. Nonetheless, either despite or because of Singh, some Irish tourists told me that the Aran Islands were considered the heart of the heart of the country. I never worked up the nerve to ask any of the islanders what they thought of the play, and resolved to never claim I was the playboy of the Western world. The two Iron Age ring forts I visited on the island of Inishmore are still strongholds in my memory. The big fort, its name is anglicized to Dun Angus, and a smaller one called Dun Duvahair, or the Black Fort. They are a relatively short uphill walk from Kilronan, with red and white signs marking the way. Both forts were built without mortar by fitting stone to stone and so creating a sturdy, solid wall without a crack you could fit the tip of your finger into. I called them ring forts, but each of them is half a ring. They were built at the very edge of steep cliffs 300 feet high, with the churning sea below. No need to complete the circle and build a wall on the Atlantic side. If your enemies managed to reach the keep and storm the walls, the only option was a leap of faith off the cliff, into the wide sky, the rocks, and the waves. Dun Angus is a formidably beautiful feat of engineering and construction, but what I saw when I looked down from the ramparts into the wind was fear. Terrible fear was what built these walls. 
large enough to hold every man, woman, and child who could get there in time, and whatever livestock they could manage to bring with them. Fear of that unfamiliar sail on the blue plain of ocean. Celtic tribes from the mainland, or Vikings come to steal gold and cattle, to murder and enslave. I had to cross the spine of the island to get to the smaller black fort. Here the rock was pitted and puddled with rainwater, and had deep fissures and cracks in it. If I wasn't careful where I stepped, I could easily get a foot caught or break a leg. And if that happened, I could have lain injured a long time, for there was no one within sight and not a sound from man, beast, or engine. There was no gate in this fort either, no opening in the twenty-foot walls, but a single two-and-a-half-foot-wide stone between the end of the wall and the empty air a three-hundred-foot drop into rock-studded foam. I gingerly stepped onto the flat white slab. And good Jesus, two gray dogs shot by on either side of me. I tottered for a breathless moment, then stumbled into the fort. I lay there for a very long while in the thick mat of grass, catching my breath and listening to the systole and diastole of the sea. Though it's true I had an easy time following the signs and finding the huge and obvious Dune Angus and the less obvious Black Fort, it might have been nice to have a sign that said, Dangerous Entrance, Watch Your Footing, or Beware of Grey Dogs. To the Irish, this sort of information is extraneous. They will cheerfully point you in the right direction, but you had better watch your step. It was on the road to Clifton, in the region of Connemara, near Galway, that I saw the man sitting on the wall. The wall was out in the middle of nowhere, in a broad, stony, treeless valley, not a house or any other type of building reasonably close in this open country, in which I could see miles in every direction. I had stopped to take some pictures of the three bends, bald, rocky mountains and a far-off panorama of a monastery by a lake when I saw him nearby. He sat with his feet dangling, perfectly still. He acknowledged my presence with a minimal nod of the head, and then he went on, sitting on his wall, motionless in the middle of no place. He just sat and sat and sat, and didn't move. An oldish man in the typical Irish tweed cap, holding a cane or a walking stick. For all I know, He'd been there an eon before I came, and he's still out there. I doubt if he even got up to take a leak. The west of Ireland I found in the 80s was one in which men sat on walls until they wore out the stones. Time and place and the laws of physics were different in Ireland. So you've missed the bus. Ah, oh, well, there will always be another. So let's go next door to the pub for the crack the high point, the best part, of the evening. Let's have a whiskey, and I'll tell you about the Norman Castle, and then we'll go have a look at it. In that Ireland, you were never late or lost. There were no such conditions. I found out early on that if you had the American fixation of getting precise and useful information quickly and easily, in Ireland, you were basically out of luck. Important details were often left out of conversation, I suppose, because no one thought to tell me what I did not think to ask, or I did not phrase the question exactly. This was a source of considerable worry. I decided to conduct my own statistical survey whenever I had to get walking or driving directions or catch a bus, train, or boat. I would ask at least five different people every question I could think of from every possible angle, weigh their replies, compare the answers, and sort out what was consistent to try to figure out what must, at last, be so. I thought myself pretty clever to have come up with what seemed a foolproof method. I conceived of it as a kind of triangulation. I stood at the first angle, and the Irish stood at the second, while the answer was at the third. If I could get the second angle right, 
I would surely know the truth. On my last day in the errands, as I arranged to go home, I found that there were two ferries leaving Kilronan Harbour, on Inishmore, for the mainland. The red ferry cost ten pounds, and the blue ferry thirteen. So I asked at the ticket window what the difference was. No difference, I was told. They both go to the same place. Even after asking every conceivable question and getting the same answer, I felt extremely uneasy. I could find no American, Brit, or German among the crowds who might run by a more precise system of time and navigation. So I wandered the streets of Kilronan, asking old men, young women, tourists, islanders, and Irish people of all shapes and sizes. What is the difference between the two ferries? No difference. But why then does the blue ferry cost more than the red ferry? Do they both go to the same place? Same place, I was told. No difference. I hardly dared to tackle another part of the problem that also made no sense. I naturally assumed that since I'd taken a ferry, what color it was I didn't remember, from Galway City to Kilronan, I could take the same ferry back to Galway Harbor. But both the red and blue ferries inexplicably went to Rossaville, an obscure town on the Galway coast. How was I supposed to get to Galway City and then to Shannon Airport for my flight back home? Isn't there a ferry that goes to Galway City? No ferry goes there, I was told. So then I would plead, but I took a ferry from Galway to get to Inishmore. How did that ferry get back to Galway? No ferry goes to Galway. But when the ferries leave the mainland, where do they go? Do they go to Galway City? How do they get back here? How did the ferry I took from Galway get there in the first place? I took to demonstrating my quandary by drawing triangles in the air and showing that the ferry had to somehow get back to Galway City from Inishmore to be in Galway in the first place. But it was no use. I not only got the same answers, but a bit of the talk as well. No difference. Same place. There's no ferry goes to the city of Galway. My uncle lives in Chicago. His name's Michael Feeney. Do you know him? What else could I do but buy a ticket for the cheaper red ferry? I grew up among generations of Irish Americans who because of, in spite of, past persecution, clung to their ethnicity and, yes, while it's very apparent to the native Irish that we are Americans, we still retain a lot of Irish attitudes, behavior, and general way of being. The Irish love America. It is a source of great pride to them, as Irish emigrants have had so much success here in the United States, including Presidents Kennedy and Reagan, and an endless stream of important politicians and public figures. Though the Irish are indeed very tribal, they often treat us like cousins, if not like immediate family. So I got on very well with the Irish, and I could read them pretty well most of the time. This is why I still cannot understand how I could not seem to get what seemed to me obviously important travel information out of them. On my last night, I had dinner with a Brit named Peter, who was staying at my B&B up the hill from Kilronan proper. He was tall, thin, and neatly dressed, informally, but like a business type on vacation with glasses and short, curly blonde hair with a slight reddish tint to it. A friendly enough guy, but a little stiff. I think as much because he was a stockbroker as because he was a Brit from London. And I suppose I was the overly friendly, loquacious American. But I was Irish American, and so, I thought, despite my communication and navigation struggles, a bit more tuned to the Irish and able to read them better than he could. I had told him about a restaurant in Kilronan, where I had eaten several days before. Though the place was inexpensive, it still had white tablecloths and served wine. I recommended that we order the baskets of corned beef sandwiches, which were easy on the wallet. The corned beef might have come out of a can, but it tasted good, and each charming basket held about eight small sandwiches, the right amount for one hungry man. While we waited for our meals, Peter, being thoroughly and obviously English, 
told me how amazed he was that the Irish were so polite to him and that they had basically treated him well. In spite of all the terrible things we did to them, he added. However, when the meal was served, it was apparent that while I had gotten eight sandwiches, Peter got only five. Peter's face flushed with annoyance. He called loudly to the entire staff of the restaurant. How is it that I have only five sandwiches, while my colleague here has eight? How many sandwiches come in a basket? I can only call his manner imperious. It definitely had the air of command about it, a master-to-servant tone. All of the waiters and waitresses looked like college kids from the Irish mainland working summer jobs, with rolled-up sleeves and green aprons. They stopped what they were doing and visibly stiffened. There were not many customers in the restaurant at that time, but the silence went on long enough for me to want to duck behind my water glass with embarrassment. Here I was, a traitorous Irish-American, sitting and having a collaborative meal with a most imperious Brit. Our waiter replied, It says a basket of sandwiches on the menu, but it doesn't say how many. It was hard to tell if the waiter's face was flushed or if it was naturally reddish, but his delivery was curt and he immediately turned his back, putting fresh silverware on a table. The restaurant filled to the brim with silence. No more sandwiches came out of the kitchen. Peter did not push it and said nothing more. He seemed completely unruffled by the response to his complaint. I think he realized that he wasn't going to get anywhere, so he let the matter drop. Maybe this was just British cool, a kind of stiff upper lip. But I wonder if he saw what I saw. I didn't think of offering him one of my sandwiches. I was too busy being shocked, embarrassed, and annoyed. I think now that we were in two different countries. Another place I frequented during my week on Inishmore was Jimmy Mack's Pub. One afternoon, after my tourist rounds, I met a local schoolmaster and we had a few pints together at the pub. He was an Irishman from the mainland and he was fully fluent in Gaelic, with even a wide knowledge of Gaelic literature. But because he did not grow up speaking Gaelic as a first language, to the islanders he spoke book Irish, he told me. And so to the people of Erin, he was considered a kind of second-rate Irishman, and a foreigner. Then what was I, I wondered, being three generations removed from Ireland? A fourth-rate Irishman? No, not even that. An Irish-American with a strong but foolish desire to find the Ireland in himself and himself in Ireland, who mispronounced a few Gaelic phrases, romanticized the lost language, the bitter famine, the music, the people, and even the stones. The islanders knew that their Ireland and mine were not the same. So I wondered then, and I wonder now, what are we looking for when we travel? I think it varies with the traveler and the reasons for traveling. It is no coincidence that the words travel and travail have the same root and once meant the same thing. The vast Irish emigration to the United States in the 1840s was travail, not travel. And the long lyrical echo of that travail, in the songs, poems, stories, plays, and novels, in the terrible history and the last slow unraveling of the once clannish, close-knit Irish community in my native Baltimore, had filled me with a longing to know the country of my ancestors and to feel some sense of belonging there. I am sure that the reasons we have for leaving home and what we're looking for, whether safety, adventure, drama, or belonging, have everything to do with what we find, whether illusion, disillusion, another harsh reality, or the land of our dreams. I think Singh found the country he wanted, but it was not the one in which the Irish at the Abbey Theatre hoped to recognize themselves. It was the one that had so often been used to wound them, part caricature and part truth. The schoolmaster, Peter, and I had both brought our unavoidable histories and preconceptions with us to this place, 
which had its own impenetrable history and prejudices. Each of us was no doubt looking for a different Aaron. The schoolmaster, who might have thought he would be accepted in the heart of Ireland for his fluent, educated Gaelic, was not considered part of the tribe because he was from the mainland, and his Gaelic was schoolbook formal. Peter, because of his English accent and bearing, would never quite get past the long-ingrained catastrophes and resentments. After the initial Irish politeness, there would often be the dropped smile, the wary stiffening in the face. After my dinner with Peter, I found my way to Jimmy Max for the crack on Saturday night. The band was so blasted, they played with eyes closed in a transcendental state of drunken intensity. The fiddlers and strummers like Buddhas in whiskey nirvana. The place rocked back and forth to the clapping of hands and the stamping of feet, as if the waves were playing keep away, and the bar was a tugboat tossed in a storm. And after the pub closed, there was a traditional Cayley, a dance in what looked to be a church hall located up the long, steep hill from the harbor. There, a large group of musicians gathered to play waltzes, jigs, and reels. I danced with a young American woman, the only other American I met on the island. The days of high June are the longest days of the year, and this far north, the twilight lingered. The sky was glowing indigo well past midnight. Into this, the real Celtic twilight, the crowd streamed onto the main street of Kilronan. To go home, most people either went up or down the hill. There wasn't much to the town on the right or left, only the one long, steep main road that went the length of the island. In the intense blue glow, only the shapes of our bodies could be seen in silhouette. We were rounded out forms in blackened bronze, the outlines of a head and the slope of the shoulders. Not a face could be recognized. As the young islanders laughed and talked quietly in Gaelic, I thought they had no idea that I was not one of them. A shadow among a crowd of shadows, as gate by gate, house by house, they kissed, said goodbye, and turned off. The crowd gradually thinned. In the darkness, I belonged. It seemed to me that I approached the crown of the hill among my living ancestors. As I came to the gate of my B&B, the voices moved up the road ahead of me and merged into the distant lull of waves. I no longer felt sure what century it was or how to pronounce my own name. It was with overwhelming nausea and a sick sense of irony that I boarded the Red Ferry the next morning with a severe case of food poisoning. I wondered if the Englishman, Peter, had suffered the same plague and if the provinces of his stomach and bowels had now revolted against him. Anyway, he was, at least, three sandwiches better off than I was. Every pitch and roll of the Red Ferry was recorded by a queasy seismograph in the sloshing pit of my stomach. A dozen or so people sat on the benches as the ferry chuffed along, middle-aged couples, some with children. Mostly, they looked to be tourists. They probably thought I was seasick and so left me alone. I sat on a little white bench by myself, silent and standoffish, afraid to open my mouth. Off the bow and not far away, the blue ferry also plunged and tossed toward the mainland. We arrived at the dock at nearly the same time as the Blue Ferry. The Red Ferry people walked up the pier and into the parking lot, where they proceeded to get in their cars and drive away. I watched as the parking lot emptied. Meanwhile, the Blue Ferry people walked to a turnaround where a bus waited, doors slung open for them to board. A big sign above the windshield on the front of the bus spelled out Galway in big white letters. I was struck in a flash by a sudden insight, as if a flaming meteor had dropped out of far space and plocked me in the noggin. What a grand, splendiferous fool I was. Everyone on the Blue Ferry had a bus ticket to Galway. That's why it cost an extra three pounds.
I stood alone, without a bus ticket, and looked around in a panic. There are some profoundly empty places in Ireland, and this was one of them. There was nothing here but the Atlantic Ocean, a pier, a parking lot, and a turnaround with one white house on it, and, of course, the bus, which was idling before takeoff, but definitely not waiting for me. The seats were plainly reserved for the passengers of the Blue Ferry. I still felt sick as a marmot, but I had to do something. I couldn't approach the bus without a ticket, and there was no way of getting one. I still had that American sense that giving cash directly to a bus driver is like offering an illegal bribe. I felt it could easily provoke anger and make the driver look dishonest in front of a busload of witnesses. I assumed he would not take the money, and any attempt to persuade him to let me on the bus could get me into trouble. I was just plain stuck in the middle of no place. But then I noticed a tall, gaunt, dark-haired man who I knew had not come from either ferry walking up the turnaround toward me. With completely naked desperation and absolutely no context, I announced to this stranger, I took the red ferry by mistake. I need to get to Galway. What can I do? He pointed to the White House. Go knock on the door and ask the woman who lives there. This sounded absolutely crazy to me, but it was the only option I had. I was too desperate to ask the gaunt man who the lady was, and why in sweet and holy hell I should do that. I was all out of triangular questions, and had to take his suggestion on faith. I walked up to the porch of the mysterious white house and knocked. A woman in a blue knit sweater came to the door. I stumbled all over myself as I explained about the bus the Red Fairy, and the Blue Fairy. What can I do? How can I get to Galway? I said finally. You could try offering the driver some money, she said. I thanked her, turned, and ran toward the bus with my suitcase in one hand, digging with the other for a fistful of Irish pounds. And I still don't know how the fairies ever get to the city of Galway. This story is copyright 2018 by Michael Fallon. This recording is copyright 2021 by Rivercliff Books and Media. All rights reserved. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. The story featured in this episode is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, or persons, living or dead, is entirely coincidental.